Okay, my name is Alan Sondheim, and um, I'm really not sure I'm an artist in the sense that I don't really produce products, but more I work with processes, and I've been writing something called the Internet Text, which is a piece a day, or a theoretical essay a day, uh, that I've been doing since 1994. So there's a massive amount of material which builds on itself, built on other things. And one of the things I've, I've been interested in is, um, trying to get this, one of the things I've been interested in is the relationship of the digital to the analog and the digital to the body. And I don't mean in the sense of uh, prosthetics or cyborg, but the body itself as kind of flesh or as uh, the body in genocide, or the body in disease, or the body in ecstasy. All of these bodies which I think get forgotten in a lot of theoretical discourse. So that's, this keeps falling or I'm falling? I'm, maybe I'm getting shorter. Um, so that's what I'm interested in is, is the body. And a lot of my work is very negative uh, as a result of all of that because I'm, I'm sort of pushing those, those boundaries. Um, one of the things that I, one of the organizations I do belong to is something called the Electronic Literature Organization, and I usually speak at their conferences. And I, I talk a lot about, or think a lot about, the fact that you can make very good poem generators, okay? Um, digital poem generators. So I was thinking, well, you can have a, a digital poem generator generating something like, oh my God, I'm dying, and now my parents are crying. I just made that up. Thank you. Um, something like that. And with that, you know, if it's generated by a machine, what does it exactly mean in, in the world? And to me, the fact that you can make poem generators or language generators that imitate and might even eventually surpass what poetry looks like for a lot of people uh, might produce meaning for a lot of people. To me, there's a real problem there because it's not connected with the body. So I'm interested in the body, and I'm calling this something, I'm calling the term, I'm, I'm talking about this at the ICA next week, and I'm using the to term somatic ghosting. In other words, a kind of ghosting that of the body, uh, the, the flesh of the body in the digital and the recuperation of the body outside the digital. So the body, in a sense, is looming behind things. Anyway, okay, so that's, that's that. So then, I, uh, with Asia Carter, my partner, uh, we got a series of residencies at West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia, and we found upstairs a virtual environments laboratory that was in boxes a lot of it had been uh, was about 10 years old and it was all put away and we had access to it. We set up the virtual environments lab basically from scratch and I had a graduate student working with me, uh, Gary Manis, who was an expert in C++ and so he started to rewrite some of the software that we were using with the machinery and what I was particularly interested in was motion capture. Uh, you all know what motion capture is, I think. It's, it's fairly common nowadays. But I got interested in the idea of behavioral uh, filtering, which I think is probably up on the screen there. Uh, behavioral filtering being the idea that just as you can have a filter uh, dealing with, if you, in Photoshop, say, you can take the color out of a picture and make it black and white, you can increase lower contrast. I was interested in the fact that what motion capture does is basically captures movement. So you do something like this, and that's put into a file. The files we were using were called BVH files. They're put into a file that captures all of this. And then from that file, uh, then you can get something that looks like a dancer or a, a human uh, horse or something like that, a centaur something like that following through the motion. But what I wanted to do was to go in there and have a filter. So just as you can have a filter changing the color, I wanted a filter to be able to change on the fly things that were happening uh, in, in motion capture to actually change it. So if I do something like this, 
the filter might make it go like this. Um, and the way it did that was by we put an interfaces, just Linux interfaces, but just interfaces between all of the sensors and the output, between the sensors and the output of the sensors. So before it ever reached, all this material ever reached the motion capture software itself in the final form, we had all of this, this other layer that we added that allowed us to control and change things. It's a real simple example. If you know trigonometry at all, uh, you know that the um, tangent curve goes to infinity, goes up and down, and it goes to infinity above and infinity below, and it's like this. So if you substitute a tangent in for a sine, instead of motion going like this, it goes <laughs> to infinity, and you kind of break, break the model. And I started working with this, and I began to realize that when we were doing this kind of thing, what we were doing was actually producing uh, models that were very, very disturbing in a lot of ways. And so all of this work is working with the disturbances in relationship to human beings producing this work. So, okay, I can close this part down. And I'm just going to go through this and show things pretty much at random. I never prepare my talk, really. Um, I do prepare it, but I don't have anything that I really feel I have to say. Um, so I'll give you some examples of this. This is from a show that was at West Virginia University. Let me see, is there sound? So this, this kind of thing was done very early on uh, in the work we were doing. This is Azure who was manipulating. Here, this is how early this equipment is. There is a sphere on a stand. That is a, actually an antenna that receives radio waves. Azure is wearing harnesses that are, these have, I think there were 18 to 20 uh, different sensors on the body, and as she moves around like this, this picks up the, the antenna. You can't, I'm pointing to that, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, the antenna picks up the sensors and makes, uh, makes out of that, reconstructs the body. It's very early. I think this part of this was done in around 1998. Um, I know that because the equipment was completely out of date. Uh, at the time that we revived it. We had to revive uh, two, two computers for this. Later on, we started doing other kinds of experiments with that. So that's what you saw there was uh, that. We started doing other kinds of experiments with that and started extending things so that we were able to make much more complicated avatar movements. And we did that by exporting the files, the altered files, into Blender, which is a 3D modeling program. And so we get this. OK, this is actually an avatar that is modeled onto what are called metaballs. I don't know if these are pieces or they're pieces of pieces. It seems to me it's almost more like, like a, a flow, an image, uh, still in uh, media image flow that this all relates to. Uh, so we started working with the body in other ways. And one of the things we, we started to use, and this to me I'm still finding really exciting, uh, there was something that they had at the university called the Access Grid. The Access Grid was a Linux, a complicated Linux program. It ran on three machines simultaneously. It needed all three machines. Uh, and it was basically a conferencing tool so that if you have a classroom here, let's say this is a classroom, 
you have a screen there which has another classroom with life-size figures, and that other classroom could be in Sydney, Australia. So the, it's, it goes back and forth. It's like a transparent window between two classrooms. And it, so it, had, it needed a lot of machinery at that time because it had something like six to eight cameras set up just a, on our node, and then that connected, um, and maybe five different uh, audio uh, microphones, and then that connected um, to another university. But we started to use it in a, a way that I found really interesting. We started to use it as a way of sending signals around the world. So if somebody moved, this, it was a feedback mechanism. If I move my hand like this, you, you all know what video feedback is. You move your hand like this, and then you see your hand like sort of expanding and moving. At the same time, when you aim the camera at the monitor, and it makes like smaller images. But we set it up so if I move my hand like this, that image went around the entire world. We went and sent it through Sydney, Australia. Uh, came back, added it to the image that was on the screen, and kept doing it. So we're creating a world circuit. This was done, um, I guess, what was that, like 2004, maybe 2005, something like that. So this image was going, going continuously around the world. So this is just the arm and the hand, and the hand one. I saw that other little arrow on the thing and thinking I'm moving the mouse and nothing is moving. Okay, so you get the idea of this. We also started working with laser uh, stuff. So here is, let me see if this works. Here is Azure sitting in a chair. We started working with these kinds of distortions. And right there is a little dash on the wall where the arrow is. And what this is, this is a laser that is uh, doing a 3D modeling of the entire room. This is a, a laser that was so powerful, they used it for modeling the State House in West Virginia. In other words, it's, it, if you looked into it, you'd be blinded, which my camera found out at one point, because it blinded my camera. Um, blinded? It should be like blonde, blounded. It what? Burnt it out. Yeah, it burnt, it burnt it out. But this is the result of it here. There's Azure sitting there, it did a complete three-dimensional model uh, of her. Obviously, this is very crude, but the very fact that we could do this was interesting. Again, it's working with models and working with technology in the two, in some kind of relationship uh, with each other. Just have to see with, oh, these are some of the models that were produced later on that, that are up on the wall. These are some still images. This is. We started extending the idea of the avatar so that this, this is something I just started working with. This is an avatar, actually, uh, an abstracted avatar. And as these are the geodesics that are formed on it that are used to make the, you know, if you're printing out. But as you go in on it, the geodesics change, and you start to get this pattern. So you get the idea of a kind of flat raster across it that changes. So I'm interested in the sort of the phenomenology, the philosophy behind this sort of thing. You've got all these local symmetries that change constantly as you go in and out of the figure. And that sort of, that sort of fascinates me. There's Azure doing her thing. This is an example we are working. Uh, I forget his name, but it, it was that the two of them together were working, and this is the sphere picking it up. Now, this started me on working in a, a, another kind of direction, which I'll show you a little bit of. I don't know how much time we have, but um, where two people both have... What? Okay. Two people both have um, sensors on them, 
and so they form a single fi figure. So we started to think, I started to think of this as a, a kind of collaboration among people, like we worked with dancers, let me see if I can find that, it's not in here. Uh, later motion capture. Okay, here's, here's one example where you have, we had three uh, women, two of uh, whom were in harness. This was done in Chicago. And the, all three of them are moving a single, a single avatar. So the avatar, in a sense, is embodied by three people. The three people had to work in collaboration with each other, otherwise the avatar would fall apart. It would just stop doing anything. So I could go on about that because it has a lot to do with the idea of virtual community, forming virtual community. Here's an example that was... This was from... Where an avatar is being moved by two people. This one was from NYU. There are two people moving the avatar and they have to work in collaboration with each other, otherwise the avatar freezes as you can see it's so he would go forward. This is working. I wanted to see what we could do on a small. This is me playing clarinet. I play music. Um, and every every one of those dots represents a different joint in the finger. And let me see. I will end up on if I can find it. It's one of these. <coughs> Uh, this is another one. This is the most recent stuff. There's a lot of writing that goes with this. It sort of explains the uh, philosophy and stuff behind it. <laughs> Sounds like a, a truck going by. You can see when the two people move apart how it stops changing. is an archaeology of the whole thing. say something about the people we work with. Um, one of the main people was Fufua de Mobilite, who was, uh, was lead dancer with Merce Cunningham. And Azure and I have worked with him extensively on uh, dance work. And that stopped when he finally left the United States permanently a few years ago. But we were doing work uh, together. There was a woman, Kira Sedlock, who was at uh, West Virginia University, who did a lot of this stuff as well. And uh, what fascinated me was the people who were most into it were the women. And at one point we tried to work with men and we had two men, I forget even which university it was, but there were two men who were from musical theater. Chicago. Chicago and their, their whole movement would be like, you know, because they were sort of imitating musical theater posturing. Jazz so, hands. Jazz hands, yes. So, uh, oh my God, uh, it, it, was, it was really awful. So using this work, I've, I've sort of extended to, with this to thinking about issues of genocide and so forth, but that would take a lot longer talk to indicate the relationship. Thank you.